Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, it's a real pleasure and, uh, of course, an honor for me to be here to represent NATO Airborne Early Warning and Control Force at this impressive gathering of air-minded people. And I thank uh, the general before for taking the burden of being the first one after the lunch break, so uh, hopefully it makes it easier for me. My aim today is to provide you with an overview of uh, NATO AVEX capability and the roles we fulfill before moving on to where the force is going to in the future. I will show how our mission and its associated tasks have been evolved through the years and how we have upgraded our capability to meet those tasks as the issues and themes we face today are very similar to those from our last 35 years. I will then take a brief look at the changing strategic environment in which we operate to explain what we think that means for us as Airborne Battle Management Command and Control Operators and then describe the capability upgrades we plan to make to take your, our capability to its planned out of service date in 2035. I will use the E3A capability evolution as an example, but would stress that the lessons and principles equally apply across both the E3A and E3D components and the wider NATO AVEX mixed force and with some caveats across the spectrum of battle management command and control activity. I will conclude with some uh, final thoughts and a couple of observations. On the subject of questions, if there are any points of understanding, please uh, do not hesitate uh, to stop me and ask at the time. But for more general questions, I would ask you to keep those these to the question period. To uh, set the scene, I will quickly show you the NATO Airborne Early Warning and Control Force mission statement and our current aircraft fleet. As you can see, we have 14 E3A aircraft at Geilenkirchen in Germany and uh, six E3Ds at Royal Air Force Waddington in the United Kingdom. And this slide identifies the force operations, both current and historical taskings making it very clear, even in peacetime, how busy our force was and is. Moving on now to the development of the force's role. As depicted, the role of the NATO Airborne Early Warning and Control Force has evolved considerably since its inception in the early 1980s, when it had only a single role. Traditional air defense focused on the surveillance function with an ability to rapidly relocate to fill in gaps of ground-based radars alongside the ability to provide advanced warning of incoming low-flying aircraft. This was the pure airborne early warning function that required only a long-range radar and the ability to get it to the right place and to report what was detected. As we move on to the 1990s, operations such as Desert Storm, the Liberal Force and Allied Force brought with them an increase in the E3's role of, by adding control of fighter assets, conducting defensive counter-air and offensive counter-air. At this point, the E3 expanded from its original purely surveillance role by adding tactical command and control functions and this is when the E3 gained the title AVEX that is still with us today. This included surveillance improvements in the near-term program including radar, ESM, Link 16 darker link, anti-gem communication and color displays. Moving into the 20 20th century and the post 9-11 environment, our roles had now expanded further to add broader battle management functions to simple tactical command and control, which brought an increased focus on the full spectrum of warfare to include 
controlling tactical air transport operations, marshalling tanker assets and providing support to special operations forces. The provision of support in the maritime and land domains or by initially at different levels to the air domain and a move into broader activities such as uh, disaster support. The midterm program aimed to keep pace with the explosion of data available to operators and included a suite of communication upgrades, Windows-based interface mission computing systems to improve data handling and situation awareness with five new crew positions and GPS to name a few parts. This brought us to the point where the capability was also able to act as an airborne command element, short HCE, in the absence of connectivity to higher HQs and completed the force move from AVEX to Battle Management Command and Control, short BMC2. A role we now fulfill. Aided by the addition of internal protocol IP chat, enabling operators to collaborate and communicate in multiple communities, the demand for what was increased in complexity and speed, creating the continuous demand for greater bandwidth. Around these changing roles, we have also needed to respond to changing adversary capabilities and tactics. Another example of our current expanded capability is the addition of the automatic identification system which was needed to improve the E3's ability to provide support beyond the air domain. Although our radar has an effective maritime surface search mode, it previously only had the ability to generate unidentified surface tracks which did not really help the recognized maritime surface picture. The addition of an automatic identification system, AIS, utilizes information broadcast by cooperating surface vessels that includes a unique identification code plus their position, course and speed and other additional details such as a picture of the ship and its size. This information is currently displayed to the mission crew on a standalone laptop similar to that used for chat. Although AIS does not have to be carried by all surface vessels, the presence, or otherwise, of an AIS return is in itself a useful indicator of whether a surface contact is of interest. This allows E3 crews to improve the effectiveness of its management and of cooperating maritime surface or aviation assets by ensuring search areas and visual identifications are focused on tracks of interest. Thus, AIS not only allows the E3 to augment the surface picture, but also greatly improves the ability of the E3 to act as a force multiplier by optimizing the use of maritime assets involved in surface searches. Thus, you can see that as the NATO Airborne Early Warning and Control Force, missions have grown from AEW to AVEX to BMC2. Our capability has evolved to keep pace. As the operating environment, our mission and associated tasks have continually evolved through the life of the force, remaining capable and relevant has only been possible due to a series of upgrades that respond to those changes. Alongside the need to ensure we keep pace with the changing environment, both on our side and with respect to our adversaries, the key themes within our capability evolution have been driven by upgrades required to assist the system and crews to manage the ever-increasing volume data involved in BMC2, a rising demand for higher bandwidth connectivity and communications between and across layers of communication, command and shared information, and the need to coordinate activity in multiple domains, and specifically outside the air domain where the E3 began. Now, at this point, 
I must emphasize that I'm not suggesting that the E3 is a substitute for CAO. However, the capabilities listed on the left that we had in the early 2000s have expanded to bring us to where we are today by including those on the right. To complete the overview of capability changes that the E3 has received, the E3A has three ongoing upgrades that are due to complete by the end of 2019. These cover changes in the operating environment and also help us to keep pace with the increasing volume of data and C2 information our crews are required to handle. A flight deck enhancement that adds a glass cockpit and contemporary navigation capability to preserve the aircraft's ability to rapidly access all areas of potential operations in both space and crisis conditions. Sorry, peace and crisis conditions. Mode 5, Enhanced Mode S, provides a full transponder and interrogator upgrades to conform with the traffic air traffic mode S and the military mode 5 identification systems. Finally, enhanced IP chat improves the current IP-based chat capability by adding high bandwidth SATCOM connectivity, giving data flow 150 times faster than the current system, greatly enhancing both reliability to the system and the range of chat rooms and data that can be accessed by operators. So, on to the future. Looking ahead, one thing is certain for us, and that's change is and will remain a constant of our environment. The most important feature of the change I see is that the speed of competition is accelerating and our challenges are constantly seeking ways to counter the strength we enjoy through our technological advantages. As a result, we can no longer wait for a crisis and then respond, but must be more flexible, agile and proactive. The good news is that NATO is <coughs> responding to ensure it can deter and, if necessary, defend itself and its allies. A successful response to these adversary-driven changes will depend on our ability to support cooperation between nation and forces and to leverage our technological and capability advantages. To do this, our force will need to be able to support the integration of effects across the various domains of operations. Joint operations are no longer enough. NATO must seek to adopt and the force must support a multi-domain approach and this has driven a gap analysis to define how we expand E3 capability to provide multi-domain C2. Now I do not propose to go into a discussion on multi-domain C2 for an audience such as this one and will restrict myself to the short definition here. In essence, MDC2 seeks to remain ahead of our adversaries by integrating our actions across domains to create synergistic multi-axis effects that present new dilemmas for adversaries that are more difficult to counter. For our force, continuing to remain relevant in the future battle space means evolving our battle management C2 capability to enable us to execute effective C2 across multiple domains. As shown here, the key to delivering effective C2 across multiple domains is the ability to achieve decision superiority over our adversaries. Decision superiority requires not just superior collection and sharing of information, but also the conversion of this information into understanding. This slide begins on the left with the type of information and associated capabilities that are needed to enable decision superiority. These must be changed into information using the activities and products in the center column 
in order to produce the effect we need on the right of the chart. For NATO and its partners, this underlines the need to maximize the benefits of what we have, including actions such as fully integrating the new AGS system into the wider GISR enterprise. The core issue for us as operators is that in making the change from BMC2 to MDC2, the volume of data we need to manage will become even more challenging. And consequently, that effect triangle of data will be critical to ensure relevant data is presented in the way that operators can manage. Interoperability will also be essential in the multinational environment that remains the cornerstone of NATO's success. However, it's important to note that the challenge in this area is becoming less and less concerned with equipment standards and ever more to do with timely access to information limited by its releasability or where it is stored. For the E3s to play their part, we are striving to learn from our successes based on the knowledge that the roles we need to fulfill will continue to expand to encompass more functions in new domains, that our adversaries will continue to strive to identify our key strengths, to adapt to our evolving capabilities and to blunt our advantages and that sensors will continue to extend their coverage and therefore produce ever larger volumes of data that must be effectively managed to enhance understanding rather than overwhelming decision makers. <laughs> Against this background, the force, in conjunction with NATMA, our procurement agency, conducted a capability gap analysis to define how we expand E3 capability to support multi-domain C2. Unsurprisingly, the results of our capability gap analysis determined that the themes of previous upgrades are still relevant. Sustaining current capability, improving connectivity and co collaboration, assisting operators to deal with the enhanced workload associated with new domains and expanded roles. All, need, all needed to continue into the requirement priority list for our final lifetime extension program or FLAP. FLAP is a 1 billion US dollar program that will add by 2025 enhanced airborne networking that provides a future 800 times increase on bandwidth. This represents a total of uh, 1,000 times over current capability and allows greatly improved reliability and broaden connectivity to more chat rooms. This increase in capacity will also provide operators with access to other resources such as GMTI, streaming and Intel product products, though NATO's uh, coalition shared data that are essential to fully enable the MDC2 role. In parallel, Link 16 will be also upgraded to improve security and reliability as part of ongoing system-wide upgrades and to extend the system's flexibility, capacity and range with a letter incorporating the joint range extension applications protocol, the JREC, taking the system to beyond line of sight participants using SETCOM enabling IP-based connectivity. For communications, secure anti-jam radios will be added to sustain our ability to communicate when operating against evolving modern threats and to further broaden our frequency range to encompass more cooperating force elements and partners. FLAP will also improve our passive sensor capability and will enhance our mission system by fully integrating SHET and AIS into operator workstations, introducing enhanced uh, HMI such as larger screens to improve operator cap capacity and facilitate the deployment of new resources such as GMTI streams 
and other CSD products. So to conclude, I must say that I am not for one minute suggesting that the NATO Airborne Early Warning and Control Force capability is the answer to the multi-domain C2 challenge or that it is a substitute for an air operations uh, center. I do believe, however, that I have shown how we have learned from the lessons of our past evolution to sustain our ability, our mission in the future environment. The lessons, I believe, are also widely applicable. Our planned transition to support a multi-domain approach offers clear lessons for C2 practitioners that are as relevant now as they were in the 80s and 90s. Ever-expanding volumes of data will need to be processed into information and understanding. Ever greater bandwidth is and will continue to be needed to achieve successful cooperation and synchronization of effect. An ever greater burden will be placed on decision makers' cognitive capability, requiring innovative solutions beyond human machine interface improvements to address, such as artificial intelligence for data triage or as leap similar to the move to IP-based chat we have already made. Although I have drawn on the E3A examples, I also believe these lessons are widely applicable. The technologies we need are platform agnostic and may already exist. However, I would observe that technology alone, technology alone is not sufficient and we have already found that changes must be enabled by suitable conops and supporting structures. Finally, a shift on thinking will be essential to allow necessary changes to be identified and to take root. The bottom line is that the E3Ds will continue to evolve to meet their mission until the out of service date in 2035 the challenge will be replacing the capability. Definition of a new conceptual approach to battle management C2 and its enabling ISR will be an essential to sustaining our combat edge. However, speaking purely from my current viewpoint at the delivery end of the chain, we will at some point be forced to look at platforms as well as on concepts. So thank you very much indeed for your attention and I'm more than happy to take any questions later in the question period. Thank you.